right type stuff, but I would, I would love to hear from you what being a part of C3 just over the last couple months has meant to you. On the fly. I love to do this to people. I get the real answer. I get the real answer. Dang. All right. What has C3 meant to me? Uh, I think you guys are real Christians. I usually tell Brandon on Sundays, like, hey, I'm really judgmental. Your sermon was really good. I usually always tell him. But I think uh, what we do here for community is the best I've ever seen in any church, in any state. Um, I love that four days a week, if I want to be busy, I can be. And I am. So I'm grateful for getting into community because it's important. You're going to make me cry. So that's it. It's great. You guys are wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for doing that on the fly. We love you. Um, Brett, how was dinner? Is it good? Sorry, Chanel told me you were eating dinner in the car, so I was... Hey, um, hey, would you just, uh, while well, you guys are eating, if you're eating, you don't have to do this, but um, I just want to pray. I want to pray over tonight. When you talk about a, a thing like sin, it's one thing to let it be a purely and only informational, uh, but I think sin, w- while being very important, is also something that has been easily and often manipulated, used to coerce people, maybe even used to, to hurt and injure people. Um, where, uh, where people have majored on sin instead of Jesus. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm really excited about what tonight can be. I know we had a few people who couldn't make it, but they were like, are you please recording it? And we said yes. And so, um, and I am really, really thankful to have someone like Pastor Simon here to talk about it because on one hand, incredibly rich knowledge-wise, uh, but beyond that, also um, sarcastic, funny, uh, brings a level of humanity to it, and... I've seen Simon uh, for years uh, walk this thing out, be faithful to his calling, serve in a variety of circumstances and situations, and um, that's what you want, right? You want people speaking into your life who've been through the breadth of ministry and, and difficulty and challenges, and, um, and so I'm really, really honored to have Simon here. His beautiful wife, Val, is back at home, and um, they're taking a break from each other. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Hey, but can you, just, can you just posture your heart towards in prayer real quickly and just begin to think about, man, Lord, I, I hope that tonight in this word sin that I could, that t- so many times we use these opportunities to package it in something that we're going to dish to somebody else later. Oh, yeah, I'm going to, now I can tell this person. No, 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 tonight should be about what is God revealing to me? What is the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart? How can I be revealed and shown, right? We're going into the wilderness and wilderness really quickly strips away the things that don't matter. And so um, I'm hoping tonight is that as we journey in Lent. And so would you just posture your heart that way? I want to pray over this. I'm going to introduce Pastor Simon. Let him go at the end. I've got some pre-read, ready questions, which I'm pretty sure will cover all the bases, but I will also open it up to you guys as well. So, Lord, we thank you so much for tonight. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would use um, every word to speak life, to uh, point our eyes towards Jesus. Uh, to remind us not of the greatness of sin, but of the goodness and magnitude of the cross and the goodness of Christ and the goodness of the Lord towards us. And so I pray that tonight is both informative. I also pray it's healing. I pray that it covers up uh, and makes whole um, things that were done to us or around us or where this was used in a way that was unhealthy. And I pray that today we remind ourselves of the goodness, the awesomeness, the wonder, the holiness of God, uh, but also how you've pulled us into this space as part of your family. And so I pray that tonight is enlightening, and uh, but I also pray it's imparting. I pray that something is imparted to us tonight. And uh, I thank you for Pastor Simon and Val as they've led Meredith and I and, and C3 Americas the last couple years. I pray you bless this night. I pray our hearts are open to it. I pray our minds are open to it. I pray our ears are open to it. I pray you get rid of our ego. I pray that we humble ourselves, and I pray we hear with ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, with that, listen, we've referenced Pastor Simon. He's one of our favorites. The first time I ever heard Pastor Simon preach, he had a bobblehead Jesus, and he'll tell you it's because they only ever say yes. And, um, and it, was, it was the most freeing couple days I've ever had in my life. 
And uh, I'm so glad that we've stuck around and he's stuck around and do this. And so would you give it up real quickly for Pastor Simon McIntyre as he comes to teach. Very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Um, I, I need to tell you that um, I'm not an expert in sin. <laughs> That's just to help some of you. Paul Cole doesn't believe that. He thinks I'm well versed in it. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, I love gathering with God's people, wherever they are, uh, what it, whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. And so it's a privilege for me to be here. At my age, it's a privilege to be anywhere. Um, so I also want to thank um, Brandon and Meredith. They have always been such kind and in welcoming people. And uh, they learned that from mum and dad, I think. So thank you. You've got a magnificent son. Congratulations. I mean that. And, um, so, and I love what's happening in the building. This is a great building. It's a very cool building. I'd be happy to be in church in a building like this. Uh, you wouldn't be happy to have me, but I'd be happy to be here. <laughs> so, so, on occasions, yes. So look, this is going to be slightly heady, but not overly. I think I can make it um, reasonably, but uh, I'm trying to break it down out of theological academic language into something that we can actually um, understand if we haven't had that kind of background or training. And I'm not treating you as though you're dumb either, um, so hear me in what I'm saying. So look, what we're going to do is break this up into a couple of large headings. First one, I'm going to talk about Genesis, which is the origin, what we know of sin. Um, I think I'm going to do one thing tonight. I'm not going to answer all your questions, not that I'm not wanting to answer your questions. Some of them are unanswerable. There are some things that we don't know, and there's a reason for that, because we don't need to know. Um, what we do know is sufficient for our salvation. What we don't know may, may be a mystery to us, but probably not that important to our daily walk with Christ. And there are also things that we cannot know, cannot comprehend, or ever get to grips with, because they come out of a spiritual eternity that we have so little connection, at least intellectually, with. So there are things, and I think it's important to say this, is that sin is a very big issue. We don't talk about it a lot. I think one of the things that discourages me about um, some pulpits is that the message is always about how good you are and what you can be and how great your future is. Well, I think unless we get to grips with what sin is, we don't get to grips with what real repentance is. And therefore, we don't actually enter the kingdom. We're just on the sidelines trying to have a better life. And I don't think personally, reading the scriptures, that Jesus came just so that I would have a happier life. In fact, sometimes following Christ is much tougher and less happy than immediate pleasure. Now that half you want to leave. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, Genesis. Let's, we're going to look at Genesis it's important to remember this. Genesis is primarily a story. I'm not, I'm not taking away from its historical value, but it's a story. And the value of story is story tells something better than plain like rhetorical or didactic or teaching styles of learning. You learn more by looking at a picture than you do by a thousand words. You understand that. So Genesis it has this remarkable picture of God's creation, of man and woman's creation, and our responses to it, and our failure in it. And it's better written as a story than as a series of propositions or ideas or why things happened. Does that make sense? Yeah. But that also means that some questions aren't answered. But that's the same as Jesus' parables. Jesus spoke in parables because when you see a picture, you very clearly see the truth that it expresses. So Genesis expresses remarkable truths. There's, there's a gentleman, and I think he, more than just him, there's a guy called Jordan Peterson who's very popular in some circles. Anybody heard of Jordan Peterson? Yeah, yeah. He's a Canadian academic. He's got into a lot of trouble with the Canadian government for not following certain um, gender narratives. And he's, I think he's lost his professorship as, at his university because of it. 
but he doesn't really need to be there because he travels all over the world lecturing. And one of the things he says is all the major defining themes of humanity are discovered in the first three chapters of Genesis. And he said it's like, whether he thinks it's God's word or not, he may not be saying that, but he thinks it's an absolute genius document that is cleverer, more to point, and more helpful than just about any other written document about mankind's origins, why we are like we are, and what sort of solutions are possible. So there are some very interesting people out there who see that as, um, and I find it helpful. So here's the question. Uh, what is original sin? How did they sin? Or maybe more to the point, how could they sin? I think what I'm saying is going to give you some answers and leave you with some conundrums. Um, there may be brighter than myself that can deal with this, but I haven't read them just yet. The original, the original sin, some say it was pride. That's one of the most common descriptions. The original sin was pride. But actually, you can break it down, and that's, that's, that becomes um, uh, slightly... Uh, I, I understand what's being said, but it doesn't say it plain enough, because then you've got to understand what pride is. The original sin was a clear disobedience to what God had said. And that's why saving faith is a clear obedience to what God has said. Does that make sense? So our fall away from God's presence is that we, through our original parents, we disobeyed what God revealed about, in that case, a particular tree. And what's in that story is far richer than just don't touch the tree. It wasn't quite, it wasn't, they weren't, God was not talking to children about don't touch the tree, it'll burn you. Like don't touch the sky, it'll burn you. This was way different than that. That was the original. And strangely, it's the, it, it ultimately is a disobedience to God the Son, who is the Word. That's, I find that fascinating. Adam and Eve refuted God's Word and we now know that God's word is Jesus. So they pushed back on the very early days. I'm going to ask, you're going to ask, how did they do it? Why? Let me get to that. John 3.36 says this, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Whoever believes and then obeys. So there's a... Hearing and obeying uh, is what constitutes saving faith. Hearing and disobeying is what constitutes original sin. Does that make sense to you? So believing obedience is pivotal to, to eternal life. And I'll, I'll tell you why I'm saying that soon. Now, as I've said, some say that pride was the primal sin. That was the original idea, pride. But pride is a form of disobedience anyway as it believes something other or something preferred than what God has declared. So they ate. Their, their disbelieving action was they ate, they partook, they did something. God said, don't do that. And so that's, that's the original sin is I am disobeying what God has said. That's so simple. You don't need to be a theologian to work that one out. Now, Adam and Eve sinned via an externally motivated temptation. So their temptation did not come from within, which ours do because of our corrupted nature. Their temptation was from without. It was dropping out, wasn't it? Yeah. Their temptation was from without. It came from the tempter, the adversary, which points to how could they sin? So this is the big question. How could these apparently perfected creatures possibly do what they did? And here's the rub. They were not perfected. They were, they were not perfected because obedience to the word was their perfectibility path. Obedience to what God was said would bring them into maturity. And ultimately, God's plan has never been different, that mankind would find itself in Christ. So the word is a big issue here, Jesus. I'm saying I'm making a point of it because it's important. 
So how could they sin? It was because they were not complete in holiness and they were not complete in and of themselves. We think they were complete, whole, full, holy beings. Here's the deal. They were not. There were things that they had to do to be perfected. And I'll show you why I'm saying that. Um, We require an external life force to maintain life. They required an external life force to maintain their life. Their life was not just a forever given. And the external life source, there's two elements to it. One of them is that the presence, the experience of the presence of God on a regular basis was one of their life sources. Take that away and they would have naturally started to disintegrate which is a tough word, but, or to fall to pieces or to fall out of God's presence. But whatever it was, it created corruption and dissonance in the human. And the other thing is they have a contingent upon was the tree of life because it said quite clearly that God blocked their use of the tree of life lest they should take of it and live forever. So here's the interesting thought. for uh, This is our application. Real life is not a private, internalized, I am whole, me, power. Real life actually comes from somewhere else. And you know where it comes from in our case? It comes from God's word, and it comes from people. It comes from God's church. So you're, you, we, Adam and Eve were provisionally eternal beings, but they needed two things for that to go for it. Does that make sense? So they needed external power or forces or life to actually maintain their own life, which means this, is that no man, woman, or child is ever made to be complete in and of themselves. That's my point. You are not complete in and of yourself. Your completion has got a lot to do with God's abiding presence and the, and the presence of God's church in our case, and other human beings. We rely upon those external forces to maintain life. And anybody that says, I am an islander, you heard of the old, the, the old English divine John Don, where he was dying, I think, of the plague, and he, he came up with that line, you know, no man is an island, la, 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 I forget the rest of it, and if anybody can quote English poets or mystics to me, um, and he would say, no man is an island. And we, you, you've, you've read that. People pull it out, oh, no man is an island. But it's not just that no man is an island. It's that we, are, we will be nothing unless we are connected. So they were connected to God's presence, and they were connected to the tree of life to maintain life and to grow into maturity. So one of the reasons they fell was because they were not yet complete. And it's like a test was in front of them. Does God test us? Yes and Amen. To complete us, yes and amen. John chapter 6, Jesus said we should feed all these people. And it says clearly, he said it to to, to Philip, um, how are we going to feed all these people? And it says he knew what he was going to do, but he tested him by asking him. There's a completion process that had not happened at the creation. Does that make sense to you? It helps me understand a lot. Um, So this, but even knowing that, I still think, like, that just doesn't cover it all. Therefore, it's a mystery. The why ends up being a complete mystery. How could that happen? But we all know it in life. We see people in perfectly good relationships, wonderful communities, great friends and family, and they just completely shred their lives. How could they do it? How could they do it? So we don't, we, there are things, why do Christians sin? Well, you could say because Christians are inherent sinners. Yeah, yeah, but that still, it still doesn't answer the question properly. And that's where it ends up being mystery to me. It's insufficient to explain their loss of faith in what God said. But it's important to understand they weren't perfect as an incomplete or incapable of failure. There is much we simply don't or can't know. We know what we need to know. And that, my friends, is challenge enough. So what is original sin? Because there's this term used, particularly in the Catholic community, of original sin and also by Protestants. 
What is original sin? That's original sin. No, no, it's just, it's old. So I'm going to read quite a bit if you don't mind. It just makes it a little bit easier for me because I'm not that bright. I don't remember it all, even though I wrote it. Um, We aren't fully aware of why or how because Scripture often deals with outcomes and solutions more than it does with reasons. So what's more important are outcomes and solutions than specific reasons that make sense to you? So various solutions are offered, the, 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 the prophet or offered, whatever. The Catholic and Augustinian position is that sin is trans, transmitted by propagation. So they, the Catholic Church believes that sin is like a, a how, how do we say it in our day? It's like it's in your DNA, it's in your genes. There's a corruption in your genes that leads to a corruption in your, in your soul, which leads to disobedience to God and sin. That's how they would read it. Um, And they don't believe it's by mere imitation, by me being perfect until I see somebody else do something wrong and I learn by that. That's how we we would probably think. It's in your genes. That's why an unbaptized child in the Roman Catholic Church is in mortal peril, peril unless he or she is baptized. And that's why they will always quickly baptize children and even baptize dying children. Because they believe that if they're not baptized, then, then original sin will take them forever out of God's presence. So they're consistent with it, and that's what they do. And whilst we go, oh, why do they do this? It's for a reason. They're not stupid. It's in your, so that's, and, and another major, here's one of the big problems, though. If sin is transmitted by propagation, sin is therefore transmitted by sexual activity. That's how it goes. That's, that's the only possible outcome of this thinking. And that means that sexual activity is essentially at least, um, it, it may be essential, but it's a bit grubby. And that thinking got involved, got into the heart of the early church within the first three to four centuries. You were a more holy person if you weren't married or if you were married and husband and wife abstained from sex. That's their thinking. So the idea of these men and women that created communities in the deserts was partly to maintain the faith because of persecution and partly because they believed that any form of sexual um, activity was actually the propagation of sin. It's got inherent problems in that. If we all stop having sex, there'd be nobody left. (laughs) And But it led to formations of societies of Christians who abandoned marriage and sex altogether They were the holy and we, not so much. This is short-sighted, to say the least, and it denies the goodness of God and his creation. Paul fights against that thinking, 1 Timothy chapter 4, when he says that people abstain from marriage and abstain from certain foods, both of which were created by God and are good. So Paul disagrees with that thinking, but it was a very popular way of thinking, and it follows logically. If my child is already a sinner from the moment they they are born, if if that's the case, then that means that the sexual act itself is somehow just a little bit, it's a bit unfortunate. And that's why in in many situations, uh, in, 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 in older Catholic communities, once they'd had so many children, they didn't want any more, their sexual lives disappeared. And it's also a reason why the Catholic Church is so opposed to contraception. The reason for that is because they believe that it's like a weird thing, is that you shouldn't use contraception to stop what's a sin anyway. I mean, it's strange. It gets a little bit twisted. But so, do you follow what I'm saying? But they're consistent with it, essentially. Another view, so there's, that's the view that original sin is, the, the original sin of disobedience is embedded somehow in the very soul and maybe even the DNA of Adam and Eve, and then it's propagated throughout, the, throughout time, and everybody is therefore a sinner. The other view is that sin comes by imitation, and it comes by social, the social matrix of influence over every one of us, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. So another view is that the result of Adam's disobedience was outworked in Cain and his line. 
So interestingly, Abel didn't go down this line, but Cain did. Isn't it fascinating? The first major sin after disobedience that we read of in Scripture is murder. So sin is not lightweight. They went from disobedience to God about how they were to live in an eternal state, and, they, and their, the first sin of one of their first children was that he killed his brother out of jealousy. So jealousy was already in there. Isn't that, it's a whole mixture, a whole tribe of sins is already working. And, and it's, it's quite remarkable that it happened so quickly. And it went right through to the days of Noah, when in Genesis 6-5, the scripture says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Hence the flood. People say, oh, the world's getting worse and worse. No, it's not. It didn't get worse than that. <laughs> oh, you know, society's collapsing. It's getting worse and worse, and there's more and more bad happening. Yeah, I'm not so sure. Every generation said that. Every generation said that. When I was a teenager, I was a hippie. Woo! I had hair. Ah! Uh-huh. <laughs> and so our parents were horrified at what we thought. The world's collapsing. Well, the world's always collapsing. And yet somehow it's always maintained by God's grace. But it, it didn't get worse than this. So this points, in this case, to social transmission. Let me say this. I'll read this out because it's important. The social matrix we live in teaches sin from a very early age. A child might not be inclined to sin, but it won't be long before they see and imitate. The accumulation of sin, collective sin and rebellion via the centuries is not able by any one of us to be circumvented. We don't live aside from or exterior to the social milieu or the age we live in. So, so one of the strong thoughts about it being socially transmitted is that we live, we live in the United States in the 21st century and there are certain embedded sins in this nation that you will not and cannot escape and, and no matter who you are because it's so deeply ingrained in our thinking and in our institutions in our structure, in our actions, in our words, in our relationships. So you could argue that sin is socially transmitted. It doesn't answer all the questions, but it's interesting. It's interesting, though, the reformers would not agree with the idea that children start with a clean, clean slate. So the reformers did not ever believe that the children started with a clean slate, like some, because they think that sin is utterly pervasive and inescapable, leading to total depravity. That's why the reformers baptised their children too. They baptised their children because they wanted them saved from the effects of, of depravity. Now, some of you have read a French philosopher called Rousseau. He's a fascinating person. He's about as good as a brick, but he's very bright. And he said, and I think he's reacting against the very kind of almost bleak realism of the reformers. And he said that people are born good and are only made worse by their environment or bad education. Change your education, change the thinking, and people will be good. Um, but he was a very bad advertisement for his own philosophy. He was a, very, he was a naughty, bad boy. Uh, and so it was all very well to think this stuff, but he never lived it. In fact, if you go through most of the great thinkers and philosophers of the 19th and 20th century, none of them lived their philosophy. None of them. It was unbelievable. The great intellectuals were all pervert, perverts or twisted or immoral or unethical. None of them were what their philosophy was. That's why you should always be very careful about people sound great. Go and ask them. Go and find out from their children what they're like. And you'll find out something. That's being a realist, not a cynic, although it's got a cynical pinch of salt. <laughs> so... So it, has our DNA, or whatever defines our humanity, become over time inherently corrupted? Well, it would seem that way, at least physically. So, so the question is, is it, you know this and other, some, some of you have done sociology, is it nurture or is it nature? And my answer is yes. Yes, probably a bit of both. And when people try to say it's only ever this or only ever that, they just cannot cover all their bases in their argument. 
Now let me just make some thoughts that'll help us understand sin a little bit more. Sin is a derivative and it will be destroyed. It's, sin is not an original quality. Sin is a parasite on good. This is important because people sometimes think of good and evil as two opposing forces or gods. Not true. God's original good got corrupted and that makes sin. So sin is not on the same level as God's goodness. It's dangerous, it's damning, but it's not the same. It's a corruption of God's goodness. It is not an original quality. Good and evil are not competitors. There is no competition with God's goodness. One is the corrupted poor cousin of the other. Now, many of the creation myths of the ancient Near East, they had these gods and all sorts of immorality amongst the gods and fighting each other and being corrupted by each other and corrupting the world. Genesis is not like any of them. Um, God's goodness is established before sin ever entered. So God is not in conflict with himself or any other. So sin is derivative and it will be destroyed. Number two, sin is not an eternal state. It's not here forever. The cross has begun and is working toward its complete abolishment and annihilation. So those of us who under, there's a, there's a term in, in theology that's called now and not yet. Brandon's probably used it. What it means is that now we are saved, but it's not yet complete. So we're in this, we're in this journey or pipeline of salvation. Now we are saved, but it is not yet complete. Our salvation is only complete, number one, at the destruction of death, and number two, at the resurrection of the body. So that, so Jesus has already started the process. It's, it, I think some Christians think that Jesus has been sleeping for 2,000 years. He hasn't. The process has started. The destruction of sin is in a process. And we don't always see it easily, especially if we've lived in evil times. But it's a process that's promised because it's already started. 1 Corinthians 15, 24, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father after destroying every rule and authority. So what Jesus is doing in our age is in the process of destroying every rule and authority. Do we always see it? I don't. But if I had a God view of time, I would see what God is doing. We just, we just have to live in it. Thank you very much. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Um, and then much more could be said there. So my next thought is, what is the death spoken of in Genesis 2.17? Because their bodies didn't perish. So God said, the day that you eat of it, you shall die. So what sort of death are we talking about? Well, they died initially to unmediated fellowship to God. That's death to me. And I know this is slightly controversial, but my understanding of hell is a forever life outside of God's presence, which will create, that's hell. If we understand the moderating influence of God's presence on the earth even today, to have that removed, that's hell. Hell doesn't have to be a fire for it to, to be terrible. Remember that the pictures of fire generally come out of Revelation, which is not written to be a kind of a, a novel about the end times. It's written for other purposes. Right, so what's the death? They died to unmediated fellowship with God, and this in itself led to failure and corruption. Forget about Satan for a moment. That in itself. Do you know if you're in a loving relationship and the love is withdrawn from you, something dies in you? For, not, for an average person it does. Add to that a million times over. That... And that eventually that corruption seeped into the destruction of the body. So that, you know, and of course the great, the great goal of science is to help people live forever. I mean, to me, that's, that's a horror. It's a horror to me that we could live forever when we're like we are. Can you imagine your nasty grandfather being around forever? Can you imagine your terrible attitude only marinating and getting worse and worse and worse. Thank God we don't have big, long lives, in a sense. It's not going to make you feel better. So sin is the embodiment of, or the fulfillment of that loss, 
first of all, of God's presence, and then they did not have the tree that they could um, sustain from the exterior the life within them. So this shows we're not, inter- we're not independent beings. We're what we call contingent beings, which means we rely upon something else for our life. And we, requ- and we require other and others to be ourselves. Isn't that interesting? You require other and others to be yourself. Without other, God, and, and, and others, you will never be yourself. The person who is the most realized is the person who's in the most relationship. So we died to loving fellowship, embrace with each other, and the ultimate outcome is to take the life of another, reject. Embrace or reject. And so Cain killed Abel. That must have sent uh, shivers through the angelic ranks, that very thing. So that's a a picture of what sin is, how it's transmitted, or some of the ways we look at it. There are others, but they're the two main ones. And then some of side comments about what sin is or isn't. Um, I hope that helps. Sadly tonight, we're not going to be talking a great deal about what Jesus does with sin, because that's not the purpose of tonight. But let me just say this one thing. Sin must be very, very powerful, pervasive, damning, etc., etc., because it took the death of God the Son, of the Word of God, for us to be released. The death of God in that sense, in that broad sense, to buy back the human being. So whenever we minimize sin, we minimize the cross. That doesn't mean also that you should maximize sin. (laughs) Let's have a look at the Apostle Paul because he would have wrote the most, well, he wrote most of the New Testament aside from the Gospels. So before that, I'm just going to have a little... It's an evil rabbit. Just watch out, kids. There's an evil rabbit after you. The Apostle Paul. Okay, Hebrew scriptures and, and also the writings of the time in Greco-Roman times, when they used the word sin, they used it for different purposes. In the Hebrew Bible, sin is the deviation from a divine command. We've already said that. It's to rebel against God's rule. It had moral, ethical, and religious connotations. The prophets, if you read the prophets, they focus primarily on the sins of idolatry and what we call covenantal rebellion, as well as social justice, um, and which is primarily, social justice was primarily taking care of God's poor. Not the, the whole world is not the, are not the children of God. We've got to get that one out of our brains. It doesn't mean we shouldn't reach the whole world, but primarily it was about the poor of God's people, which is, by the way, where all the offerings that Paul raised as he travelled around the Mediterranean, his offerings went back to the poor in Jerusalem. That's, that's where it went. So he, they, they, the church funded itself because there was no social welfare structures. And, um, and that's why the Christian community was so cohesive, because they looked after each other. Uh, just as an aside point. But in the world that Paul lived in and spoke, sin wasn't a religious word. It was just a word that talked about, um, it didn't refer to morality. It talked about errors or mistakes or civil failures. It did not talk about moral laws or divine laws. So when Paul used the word sin, he was readjusting its focus for those people who weren't of the Hebrew faith back toward what the Hebrew faith had taught. Um, In the book, in the New Testament, uh, in Paul's writings, he uses the word sin as a noun 64 times. 48 of them are in Romans. Romans has got a lot to say about sin and about man's rebellion. I know this all sounds very harsh. And, you know, we live in this world where oh, it's, all, it's all awesome and everybody's amazing and you're a winner and nobody's a loser. And it's like, which is a great way to treat people and make them weak and impotent and pathetic. 
is to make them feel good all day. You're not going to grow being told you're good all day. If you've got children, the last thing you should be doing is telling them how awesome they are all day. Because they're not. Some days they're flipping brats. <laughs> and I adore my children, but none of them have got wings. And neither does their father. So sin in Romans. So in Paul's theology, there are two, this, is, this is going to dominate the rest of this time. It's not, we won't spend too long on this. In Paul's theology, two dimensions of sin and its power dominate. There's two ways of looking at it. One is, I'm going to use um, big words. One is cosmological, and the other is anthropological. Or in other words, one, sin is seen as a cosmic power, and the other, sin is seen as a human responsibility. So one is because of us, one is because of Satan, or the powers of the air, or the powers of darkness. These themes weave around each other. It's hard to pull them apart. And I know some theologians pull them apart, but let's have a look where that goes. Um, in, in the books of Colossians and Ephesians, which we'll look at in a moment, we'll see how these things tend to weave around each other, one dominating now, another do not dom do dominating later. Um, there's a very interesting scripture that shows us in Matthew. Do you remember when Jesus, um, when Peter, Jesus said, I'm going, to the, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be buried, I'm going to, sorry, be crucified and then rise from the dead. And Peter just says, oh, this is ridiculous. This is just the stupidest thing I've ever heard. He, did, he thought like this, probably worse. He said, Jesus, you're out of your mind. You're the, look, you fed 5,000 people. You raised Lazarus. You, you're just having a bad day. But he wasn't having a bad day because he knew about God, he knew about sin, and he knew about what it was going to take. So listen to this. So Peter came up to him and rebuked him, not so, Lord. And then in front of the others, Jesus turned around and said, Satan, get behind me because you favour the things of man and not those of God. That's a weird s statement, that, because if I read it to you, Matthew 16, you'll discover that by, in reading it, it's like, well, who's he talking about? Is he talking about Satan or is he talking about Peter? The answer is yes. <laughs> Once again, the answer is yes. And it says here in Matthew 16, um, Peter said, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. This is Peter. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So there's, an, there's a kind of like an interpenetration there between Satan and Peter. And it's like, who's Jesus talking to? Both. Why? Because they're both involved. One's opened the door to the other. So I hope that makes sense. So they, they, there's an indissoluble link between Satan and human concerns. It's hard to separate them. This verse almost makes Satan, in fact, the pawn of human concerns, which is very interesting. Now, some, some theologians, they tend to be more liberal theologians, they think that the principalities and powers that Paul refers to, particularly in Ephesians, and Colossians are only personifications of human sin and responsibility. So they say, no, that, that, that idea of prince of powers of the air, of the spirit that works wickedness in dark places, it's just a, it's a picture of human responsibility. I'd like to say that's not a picture. It's, 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 there are two elements involved in this. There are, but here's the weird thing, and this is what's hard to, for me to fathom. Satan influences sin, but we are held responsible for sin, not him. Now he's, he's responsible for his own rebellion. But even though there's influence on sin, you are still judged for the action of sin. That's pretty powerful. That, that says a lot of things. That says that elevates the necessity of human responsibility to a whole new level is that we will not be able to appear before the Father and say, uh, the devil made me do it. It's not going to work. Because you did it, you had responsibility for your action. And I, I think that's one of the biggest shifts in Western thinking in the last 50 years. The idea that people are responsible for their actions is becoming less and less popular. 
we're now dominated by social structures. We're dominated by class and race structures. We're dominated by uh, economic structures. And, and whatever our reaction to those things, it's because of those things, not because of us. If you can fix those things, we will act better. Can I say to you to this? It won't happen. You know, when I, when I, and I have a real, I have a real um, sympathy for this. When I hear young people say, Do you know, I'm going to change the world. I think, oh, golly, that's a big ass, kid. I think the world's going to change you. But it's still good for us to want to do good and do right. I'm not saying we become these kind of hopeless pawns of kind of the world getting worse and worse and worse, so we take no action. We'll be judged for our actions. Our actions matter, and God moves in our actions. So humanity experience, some say humanity experiences these realities as enslaving external powers or forces. So they say, how can we be responsible for sin if we're influenced? Well, that assumes you're powerless, which you're not. Do you know, it's a strange thing. Wasn't it interesting that the prodigal son went crazy? Crazy. And it wasn't until he came back and said, sorry, Father, that God made any move toward him or the father. The father was always waiting. The day the, the kid was eating pig husks, which for a Jewish, in a Jewish story, that's as bad as it gets. To us, it'd be like saying they were, he, he, was, he was reduced to eating human feces. That's the same kind of picture that they would have seen in the story. When he came to himself, took responsibility for his actions, he went back to the father, he was restored. That's a very interesting picture, not just of the father's love, but of mankind's responsibility, if that makes sense. So we're not powerless. Um, so, and I'm, I'm nearly finished. When Paul speaks about sin, um, and this is an interesting one because the church doesn't quite know how to deal with this some days. When Paul speaks of sin, he singles out sexual deviancy and depravity more than any other thing as a major inf uh, infection in the church community. He says, oh, no, all sin's the same. No, it's not. Paul's very clear that sexual sin is sinning against your own body. And so he made a difference between a sin of... When people say, oh, I told a lie, and this person committed adultery, there's no difference. <laughs> well, that's a little bit blasé to say that, because there is a difference. But from Paul's perspective, holiness hugely mattered. Um, N.T. Wright, who's a British theologian, he said this, if the, and we can't prove this, and neither can he. He wasn't trying to. Somebody said to him, what would the apostle Paul think if he came back and saw the Western church today? And he said he would be utterly appalled. Number one, he'd be appalled by um, our lack of unity when that was one of the major prayers of Jesus. Appalled by our lack of unity. The Western, the Western church is, is so divided, it's like it's crumbling. Appalling lack of unity. And he said the other is a, almost a complete lack of holiness. Now, when I got saved, um, we lived in a slightly holiness era. And there were parts of it that we reacted against, and I think for good reason. But there were parts of it that were deeply and profoundly correct. And sexual sin happens to be one of the things that ruins church communities quicker than just about anything else. So you'll find in his sin lists, Paul's got sin lists. Galatians, Ephesians, Corinthians. He says that because Christianity maintained exactly the same moral stance that Judaism did. Exactly the same. And Orthodox Jews continue to practice to this day. Valerie and I live uh, in Miami on, on Bay Harbor Islands, which is... There, anyway, it's there. Yeah. And uh, we have a huge Jewish community around us. And they live very separate, especially the Orthodox ones. And they would be appalled at, at sexual sin. Now, does it happen? Of course it happens. You're blind to not think it doesn't happen. But its, it's effect upon communities is staggering. Staggering. So Paul singles it out. I think we need to re reinstate that. That sexual sin matters to the Apostle Paul. Therefore, it matters to Jesus. And it's one of those things that when we lessen it or lighten it or give excuse to it, 
we're taking away from one. Sexual sin destroys families, destroys them. You, I hear almost weekly of another minister that's gone by the way, and it destroys their church witness. It wrecks their wives. It's normally the man who does it, but wives as well. It, it makes the children angry and bitter. They walk away from God's church, deeply, profoundly troubling. If the man cheated on his tax a few times, that's not going to make the children run away from God. But cheating on their mum, yeah, that'll do it. And men are dumb. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Starting with a D, ending with a B. Dumb. I've, I've, I've had friends who waited until their children were older before they divorced their wife to marry someone else. And they thought, oh, the kids will be fine. They'll understand. Nah. You, you mess with mum, kids love his dad, dead. It's very serious, very real, and uh, we tend to minimise it. I, I sort of, this is a question more than a statement. I wonder if Netflix helps us. Because it has, most shows have sexual immorality as a teaser in them. Not all. It's like it's difficult to do one on the Patriots. Although perhaps if you went into the locker room it would be different. But I'm just referring to a, a documentary they did on the Patriots with Brady and Belichick. Um, anyway, so there we are, well, moving on. Sorry? The football team. Yeah, yeah. Not, not a flag-waving patriot, no. <laughs> so, Ephesians, let me read this to you. Am, am I okay for five minutes? And we're, we're good? Oh, it's only eight o'clock. I haven't changed my watch. I think it's nine o'clock. They want to go home. Ephesians, you were once dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived. That's us as people. Following the course of this world, that's the social matrix we live in, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work amongst those who are disobedient. So that's the spiritual or satanic influence. He talks about them both as clearly distinct things. Um, all of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of the flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath. Nobody reads that from their pulpits these days, but we were by nature children of wrath. We, didn't, we weren't working at it, we just were. This clearly describes personal agency and spiritual agency, together making for the way of the world. They are, inter they are interdependent. We're looking at the same outcome from different perspectives, making up the totality. And that theme is repeated in Colossians. I won't read it. Let me finish with my concluding thoughts. The death of Christ reveals the depth of the power and hold of sin. For the eternal word to lay aside his equality with God and die for our sins points to the terrible price that he made, paid for our reconciliation and thus spotlights the, 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 the depravity it's found in humanity. When we minimise sin, we damage our apprehension of redemption. That's important to say. When we minimise sin, we do damage to our picture of redemption. Real sin brings real guilt and fear. Now, guilt cannot be done away with by pretending it's just a religious means of keeping the faithful in the thrall of church leadership. By, by saying that is that you cannot, you cannot get rid of guilt by just blaming it on a failed church system. And no couch can ever disarm guilt. No, no psychologist's couch will ever ultimately disarm guilt because it's a transaction between man and God, not man and community. And what is guilt? It's the internal dissonance caused by the activity of sin. The cross and its power are in total juxtaposition, like you know, opposite, opposite sides, to the enslaving reality of sin. John and Jesus both preached that the, uh, the way to enter the kingdom of God is by faith in what they said, obedience, and repentance from sin. If we don't face sin, we won't see the cross. So if we don't face sin, we won't see the cross Be because we've minimised it. Why, but why would you bother? Um, and I've, my question is, how many maladjusted souls are only worsened by a failure to speak of, speak of and face sin? It is sin that separates us from God and from each other. 
if our healing is only psychological, and the, some healing can come because of the, the psychologist's couch, I, that's not a fight with me. But if it's only psychological and not spiritual, we're providing the wrong diagnosis and we do a terrible disservice to people. Jesus provides forgiveness of sin and freedom from its power. That's another big picture. Christ did not just provide um, forgiveness of my sins. He also gave me by the Spirit freedom from the power of sin. It doesn't mean I'll never sin, but it means the basic track of my life is no longer down that road. I may have little excursions. I may make mistakes, but I'm still heading in a faithful direction, if that makes sense to you. So my point there is that if we face the reality of sin, we will see the power of the cross. And I've wondered, how are we changing people by just giving them sort of pop psychology messages of, you know, you're awesome and, and everything's going to be really, really amazing? Are we changing people by preaching that? Or are we just compounding their fears and guilts and not bringing them into true freedom? has to diagnose the true problem. And the problem is that sin separates us. It's very, it's damning in real literal terms. And Christ's resurrection and the gift of the Spirit is the only thing that empowers us out of that. If I want to live in the freedom of God's Spirit, I have to live with an awareness of where it's taken me from and what, I've, what has been done to me to take me away from that. And much more could be said. But that's enough of McIntyre. So, that was awesome. Here, we're going to do this real quick. There's, I, you know, it's a little unfair to go, hey, here's 45 minutes to talk about sin. Did I take 45? No. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> the, um, but I do think it's unfair. I think what you just covered would probably would have been several classes worth of digging into different atonement theories and, and talking about different... What I, what I do, loved is, do love is the idea that, um, that both and and the yes, is it nurture or nature? Was it you or Satan? Yes. Let me ask you this question, though. And I've got a couple questions that were sent in. And I know we want to keep conversation. I know some of you may have to roll, and I totally appreciate that and understand it. I think there's a relief in many of us when we talk about the idea that holiness matters. I think there's actually a deep desire in many of us to go, yes, it matters that something is right and good and pure. But we've also seen the flip side of that idea of seeking and wanting to uphold holiness or that sin is bad and used in a way that becomes actually detrimental, not helpful. So yeah, how do, you, how do you go, yes, sin is wrong, bad, evil, terrible, without making it this weapon? Maybe it alludes to a bit of what you said at the beginning, that sin is derivative, it's not eternal. My answer is going to be rather simplistic. I believe that if we live in a loving, um, freedom-infused community, then holiness will be more or less a natural outcome of our actions. Hmm. The other side of that is this, is that when we were first saved in the 1970s, I was just makes, it's a long time ago, kiddies. <laughs> so you've been there? Yeah, you were three at the time. Um, we lived around these cultish, I knew some cultish Christian groups. Mm. And, and what was fascinating is that the enforcement of holiness was, was, was a major part of their living. And guess what happened? Guess what happens? Every time. You can every time. If you push a person to a corner and hold them there too long, they will come out fighting, scratching and screaming. Yeah. And so there was a one guy, they lived in this, they lived what looked like the ideal Christian community. They were self-sustained. They lived on a farm. They all contributed to this community life. It looked appealing. It was led by this one guy, but it was a cult. And we knew it instinctively, but we didn't have a good answer for it. Well, I heard only 10, 15 years ago that the guy who was the leader of it is in jail because of child sexual abuse. Mm. So every time the church 
um, becomes a policeman to holiness in a way that's... So when you start enforcing holiness on another, you've got a big problem, and it's yourself. Because you know that you're not that... You know that you're not that holy. So I'm careful to rebuke a person for bad behaviour. I don't ever... I'm just... That's a tough term. Because I'm aware of my own possible failings. Yeah. So, but if I live in a loving community where the spirit is there and there's a real sense
Look, we live in this, I think we live in um, this, we live in a toxic culture. You know, just, just don't throw bottles at me. It's not American, it's Western. And, and the, our toxicity is that we think that it's all about us. Mm. The individual will perish by themselves, but will prosper with loving others around them. Yeah. And, and, and this all goes back to the idea that if we withhold forgiveness, then why would we ever confess? This is a, this is a yin and a yang here, that, that when in relationship, if we're going to be people as a church who withhold forgiveness, then why would we ever believe that others would ever give us what they're struggling with? Right? It, those things yes. go together. That we have to be willing to go, I, I forgive you. Now, we, there are things that there will be things we have, if they told something that happened and you told your friend and it was against your wife, and it, there'd be things you'd have to deal with and do. But the idea that I could tell you something and you can then absolve me in a sense, that's a big term, but to, to say, I forgive you, no, you, we're going to, and to deal with that together is, but it's, it is a back and forth. We have to be willing as a church to forgive if we ever expect anyone to confess, right? That, that has to be present so if you want people to tell you all their deepest darkest secrets and all you're ever going to do is then like at least whether it's spoken or not hold it against them privately or with other people then there's no use in you being the church at that point because you again the great gift that we are that we have as the church is to bring forgiveness and freedom and so when we become when we become that when we lose that part of who we are we've it's so true we've lost so much of the power and beauty of being the church so much when we hold it, it's why so much of the divisive politics and the things we hear from stages now is so hard to swallow because it's, it's almost starting at your failure. And if you come into this place, you will only ever be that. And rather than whatever, we will forgive, but, it, but then there's still process there. There's holiness. There, and I think that's what this, this conversation for me tonight, it's the thing I love about Simon and our conversations that go on far too long. We talk about things and I act like I know what I'm talking about. And I don't. Is that... Is that <laughs> Did you? So is, is, is the willingness to acknowledge that he at 69 is still, is still reading books, still wrestling with these ideas that are big, difficult. Uh, it just yesterday on the phone, I just read this book. And it's like, I'm like, oh. The person who will tell you an answer every time you ask a question is the person I don't. I want to hear the person who goes, well, I was thinking about that too. I don't trust people who have all the answers. They don't. Yeah. It's like a, it's, to me, it's a facade. Now, I, I, um, one of the great things that happens, too, is that when, when people do confess what they face, the person they're confessing to often goes away and goes, Phew, I'm normal. <laughs> <laughs> we are all bad, aren't we? Oh, thank God, I'm normal. It does. It relieves us of burdens yeah. and pressures. I think, again, and, and I want to ask one final question, and I want to let you guys go, and I want to say thank you to team who helped set up and record, and that Mary, who was here an hour and a half early, setting yes, all that stuff you. up for food. And, um, none, none of this just happens. Oh, it just yeah. doesn't. The miracle. I, it, 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 I, wanted, I wanted to ask this question. Again, I know, listen, we could do this three nights in a row still have questions and so what I hope you walk away from is at least have a conversation and don't go I'm going to find the holes in this thing I'm, listen let's have actual curious a faith that doesn't ask questions is no faith at all this idea that we can't delve into the mysteries of the goodness of God and the bigness of God and the cross of Christ and all that it withhold all that it holds is a robust faith is one that can it's why Jesus asked so many questions but what would what would you say if people are in the room today the one thing, when we come to this small but very big word, sin, the one thing you would go, that we get wrong most often, that you wish we would get right. Okay, so the first thing that comes to mind. It's either right or it's a sin. Um, that was funny. Uh, anyway. Well, it was, it, was, it was when I was in Idaho. <laughs> It wasn't Nebraska. Um, I think the minimization of the topic in our preaching, hmm. that's what worries me the most. I don't think I'm, 
by the way, I'm, when I'm talking, I'm not, I'm not the paragon of virtue. I'm just saying stuff we observe. I think not facing... If, if Jesus died because of sin, then some of our preaching is, is, uh, is just, it's too weak. It just won't go there. But sometimes we don't go there because there are people sitting in the, in the congregation just waiting for us to rail against sin and to point the finger at everybody except them, but they're the person who's the worst. So I just think minimizing what sin is does, uh, does us no good. But talking about it all day is not the answer. Mm. Whenever we talk about sin, it's a little s. We should talk about Jesus, yeah. the big J. So always there's an answer to sin. There's a power that overcomes it. There's a, there's a redeeming influence. There's a way through. It, doesn't, it does not have to block us in chains oh, so, for the rest yeah. of our life. But uh, when we minimize it, we don't have access to that power. I love the idea that you shared tonight that sin is a derivative. It is not eternal. I think when we major on sin, it's because we fear that we can't trust the goodness and grace of God. Yep, that could be absolutely true. Yep. Where we, it, Rod Anderson used to talk about this. Where, grace abounds, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And listen, you can use that. You can use, listen, you can abuse grace in the same way you can abuse sin. It's a great way to sin using that scripture. You can, what'd you say? It's a great way to sin using that scripture yeah, yeah. So out listen, of context. You can, you can abuse grace to the, your detriment in the same way you could abuse sin to your detriment. You can, you, you can rail on either one and make them both ineffective. But the idea is what you just said, that he used to say this, that uh, it's like putting an elephant on one side of the room and, and an ant on the other. And then all you ever think about is the ant. When you've got this, you know, several ton... A unicorn would be better. Yeah, yeah, maybe, okay. To the elephant's too Something big. a bit more magical okay, okay. than an uh, elephant. But what, so the, the idea I think I walk away from today and tonight, and, and listen, sometimes you come in one of these conversations to get the juicy stuff and to get the stuff that's like, yeah, yeah, see all the bad people. Or what, but what you should walk away from when you talk about sin, what you should walk away from when you talk about temptation is both the, the awe-striking holiness and wonder of God and how great he is and the burning bush made... The, all those things are so real and so true. But at the same time, you should also get this... That same awe-inspiring holy God who said, Be holy as I am holy, also said, I have made a way for you to be so. And that love towards you is, is overwhelmingly important when you so when you come through a conversation about sin if all you're left with is your sinfulness then you've taught it wrongly yeah because so hol think, holiness should be something that's also wonderful yes and and noble yeah and beautiful and bright and shiny yeah i think that's what holiness is can i just say one last thing yep absolutely the um the british anglicans get it right um they they this would be a summation of their faith their belief we are sinners saved by the grace of God. You have to live with both. Yeah. You have, we have to live with both. If you say that we have no sin, then we will not, we will not properly apprehend salvation. But if, we, but if we say all we talk about is sin, we will minimize salvation. You live with both. You've got two hands. You've got that? Two feet, two eyes, two ears. It's like it balances your life, doesn't it? And two kidneys? Are I got you asking? Oh, yeah, you got two? I guess we have. I guess if you can give a, one away, you got the other. That's why, that's why one two, mouth, it's always nostrils. causing you to sin, because it doesn't have any balance. It doesn't... Yeah, no, but if, you, if you've got... The reason, it's not the reason, but it's a great picture. If you, if you understand both, you'll walk correctly. Yeah. But if you maximize and minimize one or the other, you I end up ask, with a walk I ask one more question. Do you think we... Okay, do you think... The quick answer. Do I, I think? This is, uh, yeah, I do, fire. all day long. Yes, you do. We've been evident. So, do you think part of this issue is that for us, many of us, we think of ourselves as the sin, not the sin as the thing, as the, what you, in other words, the original sin. We don't want to talk about it because we've so, in, like, we are the bad. We are the evil. We are the, does that make sense? Shame becomes me, not just an element of something I've done or a, the only way I can answer that, it's interesting what the Apostle Paul says. He says it is no longer I, but sin within me. So Paul separated his, his 
that, that side of him that was willing to follow the law of God mm -hmm. and this power of sin within him. So he, he made a difference, yeah. if that makes yep. sense. Yep. He made a difference. He didn't say we're all just one. It's no longer I do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So his intention was good. His actions weren't. Yeah. So, his in, so it's, a, it's a kind of a way of saying there's something, I don't think this is quite correct, there's something about us that's wonderful but dragged down by something that's so close we can't separate them, but Paul does separate them for a second. Yeah. So when, but that doesn't mean that you can go and sin and say, it wasn't me. It was sin within me. But me, I'm perfect. Yeah. That, that would be a wrong apprehension. So, anyway. I know, listen, it's unfair to, to again, to, to talk through this and go, yeah, we answered everything, or even came close. I mean, it, it, in every, even in these questions. It wasn't that questions. bad. It's, uh, but <laughs> it wasn't bad. The, Simon, you weren't even close to the yeah, mark. Yeah. Oh. Hey, can you real quickly throw off the screen of the books that uh, si Pastor Simon would recommend? And just, we'll leave them up as you leave, maybe write them down. A couple of them are, like, pretty, are they in there? It's not there. Okay. She's going to get it. It's going to be there. We'll post about it tomorrow as well. So check the Instagram. But, but here's the idea. Some of them are very educational, heady type books, but why not? And, um, but I, 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 here's what I would say. All of this needs to be worked out in community. This, this isn't this idea that somehow I'm going to get smarter than you about a thing and then I'm going to be able to tell you. It, work this thing out. Wrestle with it together. Work through this thing together. At the end of the day, love starts. It, it, otherwise, it's a clanging symbol, right? So we, we are... I'm just, I wanted to start this. We're going to do more of these. The hope is that we become, I think the church should have an intellectually robust faith. I don't think it should rely on its intellect. I do think that it should be able to intellectually lean into what it believes, even when it's a bit irrational and kind of not reasonable all the time. Uh, but I also think it should dwell in a creative wonder about the world and what it is. And so there's, a, there's always going to be that. So we'll do more of these. Maybe we'll do another one on sin because there's always more to talk about. But I'm so glad you guys are here. Could you give it up one more time for Simon for coming and sharing? And uh, I'm just thankful. I'm thankful that you're here. Thankful that you would do this. And there they are. Look at that. Can so I, 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 yeah, I tell you which one. The probably the the best one. Um, sin, in it, sin and its remedy by Paul is pretty heady. I, I would go original sin and and the fall and different views of it. This one here. Top right. Yeah, the others are all more academic. There's a sort of a way that academics write and think and, and cross-reference. If you're not used to it, it can be like, oh, what the hell is this? Yeah, yeah. But that one up there is probably the better. Again, we'll post this, and maybe we'll even send it out in an email, and, and that way. Again, let's keep, let's keep growing and learning and never stop, yeah? Yeah. And um, I'm really thankful for uh, Pastor Simon, and it's been really good. All right, y'all. Thank you guys so much for being here. If I could get a few guys to help stack the chairs and throw them back into that corner, that would be fantastic. We got an inspection happening tomorrow, so.